Our first scripture reading is Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. And Jesus then left them and went away. When they were across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, It is because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, You have little faith. Why are you talking amongst yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves and the five thousand and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, please take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, and our focus for the sermon will be verse 58, but to set the context, I will read verses 50 to 58. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 50. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, and death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, Stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to his most holy word. But thanks be to God, who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for his great and precious promises. Paul's words of worship and adoration would be a wonderful and fitting way to end the great resurrection chapter. But the Apostle has one more thing to say. For 57 verses, Paul has emphasized and instructed the Corinthians regarding the glory to come. He teaches them about the inheritance, the privilege of being believers in Jesus Christ. Because of Christ, there will be a resurrection. We will have resurrected bodies and dwell in God's perfect kingdom forever. There is victory in Jesus. Paul describes the future hope not only to correct their thinking on the details of what is yet to come, which is necessary for him to do, but also because right thinking about eternity will affect our lives in the here and now. What we know and believe to be true about heaven and the resurrection and the glory to come will shape our worldview. It will influence our thoughts and our perspectives and our actions in the present. So Paul concludes this chapter with a word of application. He says to them, therefore, therefore, in light of the future hope and the resurrection, this is how they, this is how we as believers are to live in the present. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully 
to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. In light of eternity, they are to stand, and they are to serve. They are to stand in the truth. That will be our first point. And our second point will be they are to serve the Lord. Stand in the truth. The first two phrases in this application are very similar and essentially calling on the congregation to do the same thing. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Stand firm. Plant your feet on solid ground. Be like a determined and steadfast soldier who will stand his ground even in the midst of danger. Let nothing move you. Be immovable. Be like a mountain or a tree anchored with deep roots. Be strong and stable. This is what you are to be like. So when the wind comes, and winds come, and sometimes they blow pretty fiercely, when the storms blow, when the pressure rises, stand firm. Do not move. It will be hard to stand firm as a believer, but you are to be steadfast. And this word of exhortation presumes that there is an external force that is seeking to influence the believer, which if given into, it will cause us to fall and topple over. We need to be told to stand firm because something is trying to spiritually push us over, to knock us down. And that which Paul has in mind, that which is seeking to do harm to the church in Corinth, is false teaching. People from, even within the church, within the sphere of Christendom, are seeking to influence them, are teaching them things that are wrong, that are not true, that are not in accordance with God's word. So we have seen this chapter is written in response to the presence of false teachers. And such teachers have come to Corinth, and they are influencing the believers by saying that there is no bodily resurrection of the dead. They are causing some in the church to have wrong thoughts about heaven and eternity. They are dangerous because they are leading people away from the truth. And they are teaching that which is false, that which is contrary to biblical truth, to the message that Paul preached, to the word that they have received. And as a result of being influenced by these false teachers, the Corinthians are being led astray morally. As Paul says earlier in chapter 15, bad company corrupts good character. The bad company of these false teachers is corrupting the character and leading the people to sin. They are spiritually stumbling and in danger of falling. They are being moved in their beliefs. They are being pushed into the ways of disobedience. As individuals and as a congregation, they are not pleasing the Lord. They are in danger of falling. Well, what does it mean to fall? Well, a true believer cannot fall away. We are kept by the power of God. As we sung earlier, He will hold me fast. That is a promise of God, a promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are truly in the Lord, then we cannot fall away. So he's not thinking in terms of a true believer losing their salvation. But he is thinking of a believer falling into sin or falling into believing doctrines that are wrong and that will steal their hope and their joy. He is thinking that they will fall into things, the lies of the devil, which will do harm to them spiritually as individuals and as a congregation. And so the pastor, Paul the pastor, to stand firm, be grounded in the truth, be immovable. So remember verse 1, way back in the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, he said, Now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received, and on which you have taken your stand. Paul says, In the past, you took your stand on the gospel. You were determined to conform your beliefs and your conduct to the message of the scripture. And now, you're being enticed to compromise. Now false teachers are trying to draw you away from the truth. So be alert. Be on your guard against that which would harm your souls, your lives, and the congregation. But do not give in, but be immovable. Stand firm. Keep your feet firmly planted on the truth of the gospel. 
and the same danger still exists today. The exhortation from this passage is applicable to us. Like the Corinthians, there are external forces and influences which would cause us to stumble and fall. And so we too need to stand firm. Jesus warned the disciples against the leaven, the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus said that the teaching of these influential and admired religious leaders was to be avoided because it wasn't biblical, it wasn't the truth, but it was harmful. It would lead to destruction. The yeast that the Corinthians had to be on their guard against were the false teachers denying the resurrection of believers. Well, today, there are many types of false teaching. People will stand up in pulpits and deny a variety of essential and biblical doctrines. Things such as the authority of the scriptures, the virgin birth of Jesus, and substitutionary atonement, which is Jesus' sacrifice on behalf of sinners. People who claim to be religious leaders will stand and deny these things. And they are dangerous, because if they are heeded, they will cause believers to stumble, to fall into sin, to believe that which is wrong, to lose our hope and joy, to destroy the unity of the church, and so on. There is a very real danger, and like the Corinthians, we too need to hear the exhortation to stand firm, to stand in the truth. Well, if it's so important to stand in the truth, how do we do that? When Paul says to the Corinthians and to us, stand firm, let nothing move you, well, what steps can we take to put this into practice? Well, to help us reflect on what we can do to be immovable, let us look at another passage in one of Paul's letters in which he also exhorts believers to stand firm. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. And you probably know by the reference what passage we're going to turn to. The armor of God, Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. And we're going to think about what do we learn about standing firm from these verses. So when Paul says, stand firm, be immovable, we should think, well, what can I do? How do I do that? Well, let's see what he says in the armor of God passage. Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 10. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So first consideration, if we want to stand firm, is to be strong in the Lord, is to recognize the one in whom we are to stand firm in. We are to stand firm, to be strong in the Lord. So we need to recognize that our ability to stand doesn't come from ourselves, but it comes from the Lord. If we think that we can stand in our own strength against the devil, against false teachers, if we think that we can go through life without being influenced by worldly philosophies in our own strength, then we will fall. Our strength comes from the Lord. It is in His power that we can stand against the opposition and avoid succumbing to the destructive influences. And so we are to draw near to God. We are to foster a relationship with Him. We are to seek Him in prayer, confessing our sins, recognizing our weakness, and asking Him to help us and strengthen us. And we can be confident of His help because Jesus knows our need. Jesus sent His Holy Spirit to help us to enable us to stand firm. And so we are to be strong in the Lord. We are to be committed to developing a relationship with the Lord and asking Him for His help and strength to depend upon Him. And second, verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Put on the full armor of God. For a soldier to be able to stand in battle and endure the enemy, he needs to be properly equipped. And you can let your mind go back to the sort of battle imagery that Paul would have been thinking of uh, back in Romans times and uh, the equipment and the armor that the soldiers would have been wearing. And they wouldn't go into battle without their breastplate or without their shield or without their helmet and definitely not without their sword. They knew they needed to be equipped. And if they weren't equipped, not only were they going to be in danger themselves, but they were endangering the whole army the whole shield wall that they would have been standing in. We have been given armor to us by God, spiritual armor, which will help us stand. And so we are not to go into the battle 
unprepared, but we are to use the resources that God has given to us so that we might stand firm, so that we might be immovable. We are to, we are to in dependence on God, put on the armor, make use of the resources that he has given to us. But before Paul describes the armor in this passage, he describes the enemy. Verse 12, we are to know the enemy. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Well, what can we do to stand firm? Well, we look to the Lord for the strength to stand. We put on the armor provided by the Lord, and we can do reconnaissance on our enemy. We are to know the enemy and be aware of his schemes and plans. For the Corinthians, it was the false teachers that were coming in, that were leading them astray. But behind the false teachers, it was the evil one. It was the devil who had stirred these individuals up and who was ultimately giving them the message that they were proclaiming that, were, that was leading the people in Corinth astray. And Paul says that we need to know the enemy and be aware of his schemes and plans. There is a very real and very cruel enemy and if we are aligned with God, then God's enemy becomes our enemy. The devil hates God, and he hates the followers of God. And the devil wants to do as much damage as he can to God's people. He knows that he can't harm God directly, so he seeks to harm God indirectly, as it were, by hurting God's people, by hurting those whom the Lord Jesus Christ has died for. The devil wants to see us fall as individuals and as a congregation, and he has all sorts of tactics that he uses to try to do just that. He will deceive us. He will lie to us. He will accuse us. He will make us feel guilty about things we shouldn't be feeling guilty about. There are times when there's legitimate guilt, but there's also illegitimate guilt, and the devil loves to play that up. He will try and divide the church. He will raise up false teachers. He will strive to influence the church with worldly philosophy so we will fail to shine the light of Christ. He wants to discredit us, destroy our witness, entice us to sin, and ultimately to dishonor God. Paul identifies the enemy here, the devil and the demons, because we are to know him and his tactics so that we might be on our guard, so that we can stand firm and be immovable when his attacks come. And his attacks will come. And so we are to know the enemy. We are to remember that our strength comes from the Lord. We are to put on the armor provided by the Lord. We are to know the enemy. And we are to know God's truth. I'll read verses 13 through 17. Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, first of all, did you see in that text how many times Paul says, stand firm? He's repeating it over and over again. Stand firm, stand firm. There's a battle going on. The devil wants to cause you to fall. The devil brings in the false teachers to Corinth because he wants them to fall. But we are to stand firm. And we are to stand firm by knowing God's truth. We could go through each piece of the armor of God in turn and describe how they help us to stand firm. But as an overarching statement, I'm going to say that we need to be familiar with God's truth. The ground on which we can stand firm, the roots which will enable us to be immovable, is the truth of God. And remember, that's where Paul started in 1 Corinthians 15. To help the believers stand against the false teachers, he reminded them of the gospel. He brought to their attention the message that they had heard and that they had received. Well, we need to be familiar with the gospel truth. The truth about righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. The truth about faith and have our faith anchored in the truth of the scripture the truth of salvation, and so on. We need to know the gospel truths about these things so that we might be equipped to stand. 
And how do we learn the truth? By reading God's Word. We are to be people of the book. We are to humbly and prayerfully read God's Word. We are to meditate upon it. We are to memorize it. We are to hide it in our hearts. We are to talk to our brothers and sisters in the Lord about spiritual things, learning from them and teaching them. And this is hard work. In one sense, probably the hardest book to read is the Bible. It's challenging. But we are to put in the effort. To stand firm, to be immovable, takes commitment, perseverance, determination, and energy. That is why Paul compares it, the spiritual battle, to a soldier preparing for a fight, even a fight to the death. But if we do not put in the effort, if we do not equip ourselves in the truth of God's word, then we leave ourselves vulnerable. Then we are in danger of being moved from the hope of the gospel. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. So there are forces, forces such as false teaching, which would cause you to stumble and fall. So be on your guard. Be aware that these forces are out there. Remember that the devil is an active enemy. He goes around as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And so be on your guard. Remember these gospel truths. Be familiar with them. Meditate upon them. Reflect on them. Listen to songs that we have been singing and hearing this morning. Stand firm in the truth. Well, that's the first word of application. Stand in the truth. And the second is to serve the Lord. And these two are linked. When Paul says, stand firm, when as we are standing firm, as we are being immovable, that is linked to serving the Lord. We really can't do one without the other. And so he says, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. We are to be diligent and committed to doing what Paul refers to as the work of the Lord. In light of our future hope, we are to stand firm and we are to serve the Lord. We are to abound in his work. We are to make it our aim to serve God. And as we reflect on the subject of serving the Lord, we first want to think about the nature of the work. What is the work of the Lord? What is the work that God has called us to do? Serving Him is to be our priority. Well, what does this mean? Well, in general, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to obey the commands of God. We've already, we've already mentioned the importance of being familiar with the Scriptures. As we grow in our understanding of God's Word, then we will learn of His commands and expectations of us. We will more and more see, reflected in the pages of Scriptures, the image of what a Christ follower is to be. And so the nature of our work is to follow Christ, to obey the commands of God. But for now, let us consider a few specific commands that we are to obey especially in light of the future hope that we have in Christ. First, we are to tell other people about Jesus. We are to actively and consciously participate in the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Paul has just described the glory of the resurrection. But the reality is, as Paul has mentioned, all people are born in Adam, and in Adam all die. And so we need to tell people about Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus, all who believe will be made alive. All who repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ for eternal life will be forgiven. They will receive the gift of forgiveness. They have the hope of a transformed body and will dwell in the paradise of God forever. So there is to be an urgency. We are to tell people about Jesus. what about you? Have you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Remember those sobering words of Paul. In Adam, all die. Because of our sinful nature, because of our relationship to Adam, we will die. And he's not just talking about physical death, but eternal death. But in Christ, all those who believe in him will be made alive. This is the message of salvation. This is the message that people need to hear. And so if you haven't yet trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
reread this chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, reflect on the glories to come and the need of salvation. And may today be the day of salvation for you. And if you're a believer, then it is our responsibility to tell other people about Jesus. So let us be looking for opportunities and praying that God will give us the courage to share the gospel message. Second, as we think about doing the work of the Lord, and as we reflect on the future hope of believers, that should encourage us to strive for unity in the church. The work of the Lord is that which fosters unity amongst God's people. God loves his people dearly, and his desire is that we live together in unity in the here and now. The ideal is that the local church is to be a foretaste of heaven, where we will all be living in perfect fellowship for eternity. Well, in the present, we are still sinners. And so it takes humility, patience, grace. It involves growing in and putting on Christian virtues in order to be unified. And so we are to be about that work. We are to put in the effort. The work of the Lord is to foster unity within God's people. So you remember the hope. Remember that glorious image of Christ descending from heaven in the twinkling of an eye when the trumpet sounds, and the dead in Christ, those who are asleep will be raised, and those who are still alive will join together, and we will all meet Christ in the air. We will welcome Him. We will be together forever. And if that is our hope, being together forever with one another and with Christ, well then in the here and now, let's be doing all that we can to foster unity in our church, to foster unity among God's people. God loves unity. And read uh, Christ's high priestly prayer in John 17. And that's one of his emphasis, the unity of believers. And then a third aspect of serving the Lord is to be intentional about using our spiritual gifts for the ends intended by God. As we saw when we went through chapters 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians, the people in the church had some wrong ideas about spiritual gifts, and they were frequently using them selfishly. But Paul has made it clear that they are to use their gifts given to them by God, dispensed by the resurrected Lord for the building up of His church. We are to serve one another. We are to recognize that we all have spiritual gifts. God the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, has given each and every one of us gifts. And these gifts are to be used in the context of the church to encourage one another, to teach one another, to build one another up, to bless one another, to help us, to help one another stand firm and be immovable. And so, as we are doing the work of the Lord, we are to be using the gifts that He has entrusted to us to help one another and for his glory. Well, here are just a few examples of what it means to be doing the work of the Lord. We are to be telling others about Jesus. We are to be striving for unity in the church. And we are to be using our spiritual gifts for God's glory and the good of the congregation. This is what we are to be doing. This is the work of the Lord that we are to be engaged in at the present time as we strive to be obedient to God's commands and as we anticipate the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the parable of Jesus, and when the master goes away, and when he comes back, is he going to find the servants ready, prepared, or are they going to be slacking off and doing this and that, and, you know, living as if he's not coming back? Well, Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, how is he going to find us? Prepared, ready, serving him? Paul tells us not only to do the work of the Lord, but how to do it. The expectation, give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. He wants them to be sold out in their service of God. Give it all that you have. As many of you know, they are going to try to start the NHL playoffs in a couple of weeks. And when we watch the playoffs, those of you who like hockey, we have 
an expectation of how the players will play. We anticipate that they will give all that they have in order to win. And when it comes to the playoffs, we esteem the players and marvel at the stories of those who play with broken legs and punctured lungs and so on. And whatever you want to say about a player who plays injured, one thing is clear. They have given themselves fully to the cause. Well, how much more committed should we be to giving ourselves over to the work of the Lord? One writer says, the reality of the resurrection of our bodies frees Christians from all fear and emboldens them to lives of godly zeal. If you believe in a risen Christ, one who has the power over death, if your hope is that you are going to forever be with the Lord in glory, then what's going to hold you back from spending your brief life in the here and now, devoting your energy and your time to serving Him? And of course, the Apostle Paul is an example of this. In 2 Corinthians, he catalogs the dangers and hardships that he has suffered for the work of the Lord. And even though it was so hard and frustrating and even seemingly fruitless at times, Paul persevered. Well, why? Because he serves the one who is a risen Savior and a glorious King. And so Paul gave himself fully to the, to the Lord and to his work. Working for the Lord is not easy. It involves going against the flow. It will cause us to be out of step with the world. We may be rejected or mocked by some. We will make ourselves a target for the devil. We may be misunderstood. We may work hard and then find that there is little fruit for our labors. But we are to press on. We are to give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. And we are to do so confident that our work is not in vain. See, the reason that Paul gives in this verse to devote ourselves to the work is because our labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's the why. Why are we to devote ourselves to the work of the Lord? Because our work is not useless or futile. And when we reflect on the rest of this chapter, we see that this is the case. Our work in the Lord is not in vain because, first, God's kingdom is worth working for. It really matters. People spend so much time focusing on things that are ultimately meaningless. But God's kingdom is forever. The gospel is the message of eternal life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We want to think that our labor makes a difference. It is a discouraged worker who does not see any purpose or value in what he or she is doing. But when we are serving the Lord, it is not in vain. For we are playing a part in the work that is most important. Our work is not in vain because the kingdom is worth working for. And second, it is not in vain because God is sovereign. We might think that we would like to work for the Lord, but we can't because we're ill-equipped, we are weak, or because we failed last time. But remember, God is sovereign. He draws a straight line with a crooked pencil. We are all human, and in a sense, the work that we do could always be better. But we are not to be discouraged, but encouraged, because our work is not in vain, because God can do great things, even with our meager and imperfect service. And so our work is not in vain, because God is sovereign. And he can use whatever we do to do amazing and glorious things. One of the elders at Trinity, whenever he prayed over, or frequently when he prayed over the offering, used the comment that God would multiply it according to the mathematics of heaven. And I love that phrase. And when we give an offering or when we give a service, we know that God can multiply it according to the mathematics of heaven. And so our work is not in vain. And third, our work is not in vain because God rewards our faithfulness. Even if nobody sees what we do for Him, even if no one else is aware of our labors for the Lord, God sees. He knows that which is done in secret, and He will reward us openly. 
God will, will reward our faithfulness. If we do not think that our labor for the Lord is ultimately accomplishing much from a human perspective, we can know that God cares. And we are ultimately working for Him. And He will reward our faithfulness. Our responsibility is to be faithful. And then we leave how God uses our work, how He multiplies it, whether we're, how fruitful we are, well, that's up to Him. And so we are to labor for the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain. Well, living in light of eternity, living in light of the future resurrection, these promises, these truths that Paul has been declaring to the Corinthians, living in light of eternity, we are to stand and we are to serve. And so are you doing that? Are you making a committed, determined effort to stand in the truth? Are you reading the Word of God daily? Are you hiding it in your heart? Are you meditating upon it? Are you memorizing it? Are you applying it to your lives? Are you preparing yourself and others to stand firm and be immovable? Are you putting on the armor of God? So we are to make a committed effort to stand in the truth. And then, are we devoted to serving the Lord? Are we working for Him? Working for Him fully, knowing that our labor in Him is not in vain. Well, this is Paul's application to this great resurrection chapter. This is the application that the Corinthians needed to hear. Stand in the truth. Serve the Lord. Well, let us do so. And let us do so with zeal and anticipation, knowing that one day the King will return. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray that we would be active, that we would be busy, that we would be standing in the truth, that we would do so recognizing that the King will come back and He could come back at any moment. Help us to be prepared for when He arrives. Our Father, we thank You for this chapter. We thank You for these glorious truths. And our Father, help us to live in light of them. We pray for Your blessing upon us in Jesus' name. Amen.